Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Reason Through Podcast, a show dedicated to having charitable, philosophical discussions and to helping you develop and reason through your views. In today's episode, I speak with Dr. Duncan Pritchard. We speak on epistemological disjunctivism and global skepticism. We talk on his views on how he solves the global skeptics paradox. If you find value in the podcast, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast as it shows your support, and I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, welcome back to another episode. Today, I have with me Dr. Duncan Pritchard. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jacob. Yeah, so before we uh, talk about today's topic, uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself to our listeners about like, you know, who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. I'm, um, uh, I'm a professor of uh, philosophy at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, before that, I was a professor at um, University of Edinburgh. Um, I work mainly on um, epistemology, sort of theory of knowledge and related issues. And um, uh, both sort of foundational issues in, in epistemology, like skepticism, which I think we're going to talk about today, but also issues in applied epistemology as well, epistemology of education, epistemology of cognitive science, epistemology of law, uh, and, and, and that, that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, before you even started kind of studying, I guess, academically, did you have always like, did you have an inclination towards philosophy? Uh, and if you did, like, how did you get into like epistemology in particular? Uh, and yeah, what, what's kind of been your experience? Well, it's funny. I mean, I, the school I went to, we never did any philosophy or anything like that. It wasn't that kind of school, you know. And it was only when I went to university, I think like a lot of people went to university and then suddenly was introduced to philosophy. Um, I was doing English, actually, English literature. Um, that uh, it sort of blew me away. And I realized, actually, I've always been in, really, I was always interested in, I just didn't know what it was that I was interested in. Um, and, and funnily enough, the first class I ever taught, uh, at Tuck was on uh, skepticism. And uh, that's what really is kind of, um, that's what kind of hooked me in. And as I say, my, my, my last monograph, I said at the beginning, I said skepticism is my, philosophically speaking, is my first love and my true love. And I think that's, that's kind of right. It's what brought me into philosophy and it's what sort of keeps me, I, I can't seem to shake it. You know, every time I think I'm done with it, I end up going back and writing more about it. I guess that's one of those things when it comes to like this radical skeptical, I guess, paradox. You never kind of take it for granted a little bit. We were talking about Chris earlier, former student. And one of the things he kind of said to me is like, when you, if you, if you have a view such as like skeptical paradox, and not only does it filter into like what you, what it means for like your existence, but then like, how do you treat other people? So it kind of enters in like a, a the moral domain kind of ends, end, uh, enters into it. Um, it's one thing that can be taken for granted. So I guess this is what you're saying keeps you up for, keeps you up at night. <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, I think uh, a lot of students when they first encounter it, they kind of think, well, what does it matter? What does it matter whether or not I'm radically deceived and so on? And one thing I, I try and get through to them early on is actually it matters a great deal. And um, and I think, you know, if you when you start to look at the history of discussions of skepticism and, and see how skepticism has informed the sort of history of ideas right from right from the very origins of sort of human civilization right the way through you find skepticism is something that rears its rears its head at all the key moments i mean it's what drives the scientific revolution and and so on and at each point i think it's having practical import you know i mean i'm very interested in peronian skepticism that's an ancient school of skepticism which sees seems to be being skeptical basically as a, as a, as a way of life and um, you can see uh, you see that idea actually in a number of um, a, a number of sort of classical uh, traditions of, of thought. So yeah, I think uh, skepticism is it, it, it. Once you once you start to recognise it's here, there, and everywhere, it's uh, it has application, and it definitely has ethical import. Yeah, and um, just to remind our listeners, if you if you don't mind, kind of going over, I guess the skept the radical skeptical skeptical position, or kind of how you laid out in some of your work. Um, the paradox that's kind of behind. So I think there's a whole, actually, there's a whole family of puzzles. And, and one of the things I try and do in my work is, is show how they, they might all look like the same puzzle, but actually they're all subtly different. And so I think part of the, the, the way to resolve these puzzles is to tease them apart and realize their differences. But the one, the, let me give you the core one, what I think is the core one, uh, sometimes called the Cartesian skeptical puzzle. Um, although it's not quite the one that Descartes put forward, but it's, it has some similar features very simple um first off there's a claim about radical skeptical hypotheses so these are scenarios um where everything is as it seems to be 
There's no nothing, they're indistinguishable from, from ordinary life. And yet you're radically in error. So things like, I mean, the famous one is being a brain in a vat. You know, you, you think you're having normal experiences. I think I'm talking to you. I think I'm sitting here and so on. In fact, I'm a brain in a vat floating around in a vat of nutrients, let's say on Alpha Centauri, I'm not even in, on Earth, and I'm being fed these fake experiences. So this is a skeptical hypothesis. And the first move the skeptic says, and this is really important, they're not saying you are a brain in a vat, or you likely will be a brain in a vat or anything like that, because those are all empirical claims. If they've said that, then they would have commitments of their own. They don't have any commitments of their own. They just simply say, well, you could be. Well, that's true, you could be. And they say, you don't know you're not because how would you know you're not? Everything appears exactly the same. So that's their first claim. You don't know you're not the victim of a radical skeptical scenario. And then the second claim is what's called um, a closure principle. And the closure principle is just this thought that look, if you know one thing and you know it entails something else, then you know that's something else, right? I mean, that just seems obvious. If I know I've got two hands, I know if I've got two hands, I've got one hand, then I know I've got one hand. If I know I'm sitting here now and I know if I'm sitting here I'm not standing up then I know I'm not standing up and so on kind of like a triviality but here's the thing lots of what I think I know entail that I'm not a brain in a vat in fact they entail the denials of lots of different skeptical scenarios for example I you know if I think I know I've got hands well brains in vats don't have hands so that means I must know I'm not a brain in a vat right conversely if I don't know I'm not a brain in a vat I don't know I've got hands so the idea is the paradox really is that the following three claims are inconsistent um, I can't know the denials of skeptical hypotheses. I do know lots of everyday things, plus closure. They can't all be true, it seems. It seems like independently we committed to all three of them, but collectively they generate contradiction. One of them has to be false. And that's really puzzling. How can any of them be false? They all seem true. So that's what I mean when I say to, so a paradox is um paradox is kind of like a tension within your own ways of thinking. It's uh, you can express it in terms of claims that you're antecedently committed to but which collectively are contradictory. And that's what's going on in the skeptical puzzle, I think, this version anyway. Okay, perfect. And then kind of, can you kind of outline uh, moving forward to how some philosophers uh, and the, um, how have tried to solve this kind of paradox uh, and then kind of moving into your view in particular? Sure, I mean, so some people have tried to argue that closure is false um, and, you know, you might that at the face of it, that might look like the weakest point because it's it looks quite like a technical claim, and usually we're it's easier to give up technical claims than than sort of common sense claims. But actually, as a number of people have pointed out, it's almost it's almost impossible to give it up without absurdity. You end up having to say some very strange things. You know that you know you know one thing, you know it entails something else, and you don't know that something else. How can that be? Um, some people have tried to argue um, uh, that. Um, we can know that in ours are skeptical hypotheses, even though we can't say how we know, we must know. So this is what's sometimes called a Morian view after G Moore. The thought is, well, look, you know, obviously I do know these everyday things. I know I've got hands and so on, and closures hold. So it must be true that I, I don't I know that I'm not a brain, but I can't tell you how, <laughs> right? Uh, but still it must be true, right? I mean, that's one way to go. When you've got a paradox, something's got to be denied. Maybe it's just you deny that. Another move people make is to say, that knows is a context sensitive term. So, so the idea is that, um, you know, so lo 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 lots of our language is context sensitive. So like, you know, think of it in indexical, like I, you know, if I say I'm hungry and you say I'm not hungry, we're not contradicting each other because when I say I'm hungry, I'm referring to me. And when you're saying I'm not hungry, you're referring to you. Um, and the thought is, well, maybe there are some words that are like that, they function like that, but that it's kind of not always obvious that they function like that. And maybe nose is like that. Uh, so the thought is, well, no, maybe nose picks out a different standard. So when we say in ordinary life, we know things, we speak truly because there's like a low standard in play. But somehow the skeptic is kind of illicitly raising the standards. So when they say you don't know, they also speak truly because they mean you don't know relative to these high standards. Um, this is called contextualism. And I mean, that look can look superficially appealing. It, I don't think it's very plausible. Um, for lots of reasons. One reason is that um, I, I don't think it's, it's plausible that nose functions like that. I mean, it's not, you know, we, we, we're not mistaken to that extent about the way our words function, you know, so it would have been manifest to us all along that this was, this was the, the resolution if that were the way to resolve it. 
But the, but the deeper worry is that the skeptic isn't making a point about standards. And I think this is actually a really important thing to recognize about skepticism. It looks like they're raising the standards, but I don't think they are. If the skeptic is saying, really, it's not that you, you have some reason to think you've got hands or what have you, but not reasons that are good enough. They're saying you've got no reason at all. I mean, think of what the reasons you have right now for believing the things you do about the environment around you. These are all things which would be true, the skeptic says, even if you're a brain in a fire. And you don't know you're not a brain in a fire. So in what sense are they reasons at all? You know, I've got reasons, I have experiences of a certain kind, let's say. Well, the brain of that has the same experiences. Well, that's what the skeptic is saying. You don't even meet the, the lowest possible standard. Lower the standard as much as you like, you still don't know. So if that's right, contextualism is irrelevant. Um, yeah, and I think that those are the sort of the main lines. I mean, um, I, I think it's interesting when you have a, a paradox like that and it becomes clear that there isn't a straightforward solution. You know, that you can't just deny one, you can't just simply deny one of the premises. You can't just simply argue that the premises, the, the, the claims being made are in fact consistent. That's what contextualism is trying to do. Then I think it, it behoves us to actually step back a little bit and think, think about what, what, what's, what's giving rise to the paradox. You know, like I, I think what we should do is try not to take the paradox quite at face value and, and sort of um, be a bit more circumspect about the claims that make up that puzzle. And that's what I try and do in my work. And the, the, the general spirit here is what I would call a Wittgensteinian spirit. So one, one of the things I think Wittgenstein teaches us is that um, lots of physical, philosophical puzzles, I think in a certain, sometimes he would seem to suggest all of them, but certainly a lot of them, they trade upon um, kind of faulty, faulty theoretical thinking. What, basically what's happening is there's our ordinary ways of thinking, which are fine as they are, according to Wittgenstein. And then the philosopher comes along and they, they present our ordinary ways of thinking, but they, in doing so, they subtly change them in ways even the philosopher doesn't notice they're doing it. And, and then the, the way in which they've, they've subtly changed it then starts to create problems, philosophical problems, and then the philosopher struggles to try and resolve them. And the, the real task of philosophy is, to, as it were, to undo the damage of philosophy. You have to sort of trace it back and untease and see, well, what, what, what actually happened here? Which point did we go awry? And so that's what I, I try and do with, um, with skepticism. Um, well, one question I have is, Initially, kind of what you went over is like, okay, so we highlighted this paradox. There, are, you have the closure principle. Then you have uh, another proposition where it's like, kind of like, um, there are things in this world that we seem to know, like everyday kind of common knowledge. But then you have, at least, it's possible um, that I'm in a brain of that. Um, when it comes to like this paradox in general, does it seem to have some type of criteria? So I'm barely kind of dabbling into this kind of stuff. But there are other paradoxes um, out there where. I think some philosophers have said like they just can't be satisfied together. So when you put them jointly, when you put two propositions together jointly, like the, you get this unsatisfiable pair um, and that's what's creating the paradox. So it's not like the, that there really is a paradox. It's only when you bring these things together. So um, I guess if you just either don't, if you don't bring them together, I don't know where I'm going this. I think it's if you yeah. just don't put them together, then is there anything really is there really a problem here? Uh, I don't know if this makes sense or if I'm tracking what I'm- no, It does, it does. Yeah. In fact, um, wh what you're talking about is sometimes called Humean bi bi-perspectivalism. And the reason why it's called that is if David Hume in a very, very famous passage talks about how, I mean, Hume's thought is very much informed by skeptical thoughts, actually, Peronian skeptical thoughts. And there's a famous passage where he says, look, when he's in his study, the skeptical doubts, grip him and he feels like he doesn't really know anything but then he says he leaves his study and he goes out and he plays backgammon with his friends and, and all these doubts just disappear and he goes back to normal life again and Hume remarks on this is like it's like an observation about human nature it's like we can't as it, it's like uh, our, in our ordinary lives these these doubts never get a grip but what we seem to discover when we go into the study is actually that the, the doubts are you know there's, there's good rationales behind these doubts and so, you know, one thought you might have is, you know, is there a way of sort of keeping these two worlds apart, right? Um, so, you know, and, and in a sense, you could construe contextualism as kind of a way of trying to do that. Ordinary life is okay as it is because we kind of have different standards in play or something like that. And there's something about going into the other 
into the other context, into the study, that that changes the standards. And that's why that's why it ends up we you know, skepticism gets a grip of us. So, so really, we've got to somehow stay, keep things keep things in the in the everyday sense and stay away from skeptics. You know, it's not that the skeptics doing anything wrong. It's just that uh, once we start to play with the skeptics, then you know you can't have nice things, sort of, <laughs> because they'll ruin it, right? So we have to sort of insulate ourselves from skepticism, and and I can see that that can be an attractive thought. But if you start to think it through, it, it kind of suggests a sort of inauthenticity. You know, it's like, because it kind of suggests, well, really, you don't know, but we kind of act as if we do. And that's okay in ordinary life. Um, in fact, some people have, have, have expressed that exactly in those terms. There's a guy called Peter Unger. He famously said, um, not that knows is context sensitive, but actually that it's an absolute term. So some terms seem to be absolute terms, flat and empty are like that. Nothing is really empty. There are no vacuums in nature. Nothing is ever really flat. There are no frictionless planes. So when we say things are empty or flat, we mean in a kind of loose sense. Things are kind of approximate. And he says, well, that's what it is with knowledge. We don't really know anything. Uh, but in ordinary life, you know. And so, A, I think, well, I mean, that is one way out of it. But it, notice that's, that's a form of skepticism, right? Because you're conceding the skeptic is, strictly speaking, they're the ones telling the truth, not you. But B, it also suggests that you meet some low standard. And as I said, with regards to contextualism, I think the, the skeptic's point is that you don't even meet a low standard. So it's not like empty and flat where things approximate. We don't even have anything. It's like, it'd be like having, you know, absolute flatness and then things which are not even remotely flat. That would be the contrast. So there's like absolute knowledge you've never had. And then what we have, which is nothing like absolute knowledge, doesn't even approximate to it. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that is a thought one could have, but I, I don't think it offers any comfort ultimately. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, epistemological destructivism. So if you kind of want to outline uh, your position and kind of how that relates to the skeptical paradox. So I, I think that the, um, the, I think the skeptical paradox that I presented to you uh, is actually two puzzles. Um, uh, there's two puzzles in disguise. Basically, it's, it's trading upon two, two mistakes, actually. Um, two mistakes in our thinking. And what I mean by that is uh, two claims which aren't in our ordinary practices at all. They're philosophical claims that have been smuggled in to the puzzle under the guise of common sense. And we need to sort of tease them out and then understand why they're false. And epistemological disjunctivism is meant to respond to one of those claims. This is the claim I call the, um, the insularity of reasons claim. So there's this idea which gets smuggled in there. It's, it's in there right with this thought that we can't know the denials of skeptical hypotheses. That our reasons, our reasons for believing things, and I'm talking about normal, normal perceptual reasons, right? So you, whatever you think about what you're experiencing right now or what you believe right now, I don't know. I mean, I believe my car's parked outside, for example. I can't quite see it from where I am, but I, you know, it was there earlier. I haven't heard it drive away or anything. You know, there's lots of things I believe and I've got reasons that I can give. Here's the thought. It's the, the idea seems to be that my reasons, even in the very best conditions, even if things are exactly as I take them to be, my reasons always, in a sense, fall short of the world. That is, they're always consistent with my beliefs being radically false. And that claim has to be in play in order to make sense of this idea we can't know the denials of skeptical hypotheses, right? Because the thought is that even if, you really, even if you're not a brain of that, even if everything is as you take it to be, your reasons are always consistent with you being a brain of that. Right? They can't have any, it can't be that your reasons are good enough in any sense to exclude that possibility. And this is what I mean when I say your reasons are insular. Um, one way of thinking about this is um, philosophers sometimes talk about the veil of perception, and they, they mean a kind of metaphysical veil where your perception, as it were, your, experience, your perceptual experiences could always fall short of the world. They can always be such that no matter how good those experiences are, no matter how much good contact you have with the world, uh, your experiences could still be radically in error. And I think what we're talking about here is like the epistemic version of that. It's like, not, we're not talking about experience, we're talking about reasons. Your, the epistemic veil of perception has fallen. You know, no matter how good your reasons are for believing things about the world, they always fall short of the world. They, they never entail anything about the world. Um, and that means they're always consistent with radical error in your beliefs. And I think this is something that um, we should we should look at a bit more closely. Where does this claim come from? There's not there's nothing in our ordinary practices that suggests this. And in fact, if you look at our ordinary practices, 
our ordinary epistemic practices, they're shot through with what are called factive reasons. So factive reasons are reasons that entail the thing that they're reasons for. So uh, the, the, the case that epistemological disjunctivists focus on is, um, is seeing that P. Uh, it's very normal uh, in normal conditions. If, if you know, suppose, uh, let me give you a scenario. Let's say I'm on the phone and uh, with the boss at work and, uh, and I say that someone's in work today and the boss is really skeptical about this. Let's say they, they think this person always skives off whenever they're, they're at the office. And I, they might, so I, so I make a claim that they know, I, I know they're here today because I saw them earlier or whatever. And then they might say, no, 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 surely they're not there. They're, they're always skiving off. It would be very natural to respond. Well, look, I know they're here. I can see that they're here, right? They're right in front of me. Seeing that P is a fact of reason. If you, you can't see that P unless P, that's just how it functions. Yeah, seeming to see that P is there. You say, well, it looks to me as if, or something like that. That's compatible with error. But if you say, I see that P, you're saying P, you're saying that the thing that you see really is there. And that's our ordinary ways of speaking. And in fact, in all normal context, unless there's some special reason to doubt, it would actually be odd for you to qualify, what, to qualify your reason with something non-factive. I mean, imagine if you know, on that telephone call you say, well, look, it looks to me like they're here. That would be kind of like implying that you don't really see them properly, or maybe you're not really sure it's them or something like that. But if you, they're right in front of you and you see them in good light, whatever, and it's definitely them, then you would just give the factive reason. So, and it, seeing the P is not unusual. There's lots of factive reasons in our language, remembering that P functions like that in the memorial case and so on. And so here's the question, why don't we take those factive reasons at face value? And I think this is where there's like, there's kind of like a philosophical thought gets smuggled in here. The physical philosophical thought is something like this. We can't, we don't really ever have factive reasons. Our reasons are always just like, it seems to us that or something. And why do they think that? I think it's because they're already in the grip of the, the skeptical puzzle. So as it were, the skepticism is kind of, it's in the background in the very way we've set up the puzzle. And we've set it up in such a way that we've made this huge concession to the skeptic. With this huge conception, our reasons always fall short of the world. It's not in our ordinary practices. But what's, what's really even more perverse is that we set it up as if our ordinary practice, the paradox is meant to come, arise just out of our ordinary ways of thinking. But of course, it doesn't arise out of ordinary ways of thinking. Ordinary ways of thinking are factive reasons in them. It arises specifically out of philosophical reconstruction of those ordinary ways of thinking, which is skeptic friendly. So the idea is when you do this subtle reconstruction, you can see how these theoretical presuppositions, which are skepticism friendly, are being smuggled in. And so this is what this is first and foremost, this is what epistemological disjunctivism tries to do. It says, let's go back to ordinary practices again. Let's look a bit more closely at them. Let's look at these factive reasons and then. What, what's wrong with thinking that there, we have factive reasons? You know, what's wrong with thinking that, obviously we don't have factive reasons if you're a brain in a vat, that's true, right? But, the, but that's not the interesting case. The interesting case is if you're not a brain in a vat, if everything is, you think, is as you think it is, why can't you have factive reasons then? Uh, and remember the skeptic isn't, remember it's really important, the skeptic isn't saying you are a brain in a vat, right? The skeptic is saying, even if you're in the best possible conditions, you still don't know, right? That's really crucial to skepticism, it's a paradox. So we, it's, in, it's legitimate for us to think, well, why is it that even in the good conditions, we don't have factive reasons? Sure, we don't have them in the bad conditions, but why not even in the good condition? Um, and, and where does that claim come from? It's not in our ordinary ways of thinking. So that's, that's where, that's a kind of starting point for epistemological disjunctivism, the thought that when you know your knowledge can be grounded in, in good conditions, in the right conditions, in factive reasons. So uh, I guess a quick question, maybe possible recap. So it, it kind of seems like, with epistemological disjunctivism in particular, it seeks to kind of like, kind of seeing like, okay, what is the, oh, how do I word this? Um, it seems to be the case that the skeptical paradox or what's giving rise to this paradox in the first place is because there is some type of, I guess, theory of perception that the skeptical, the skeptic is kind of utilizing and kind of smuggling that in there, right? So it makes me kind of wonder something like Immanuel Kant, where I think he has like this like theory of like represent representationalism, where I'm not like, if I see a cup here, like I'm not really seeing the cup, I'm seeing something that appears to be a cup. So I'm never really in touch kind of with the cup, I'm seeing an appearance of it. So that's kind of being, and if I'm just seeing, and if I just have these seemings or appearances, then I'm never really, I can never really have that factive kind of 
uh, force, I guess, or reason to say like, no, I actually am seeing a cup here. Uh, and so that's once that's kind of in play and uh, that's where the paradox kind of gets its you know feet off the ground. Um, what you're saying then is that epistemological destructivism is kind of saying like, well, that's not what's going on here. Like when I'm seeing the cup, I'm actually in, um, I actually am seeing this cup. So it kind of reminds me, I guess, in contrast to like a representationalism, kind of like a direct kind of realism um, yeah. or naive realism, I believe kind of something like that, uh, that you're actually in touch like with the external object. Yeah, good. So this is why it's called epistemological disjunctivism. So there, there is this view, which you just described actually, metaphysical disjunctivism. So this is like the original sort of veil of perception, uh, anti veil of perception idea. So as you say, the, there's a sort of standard view which arises in the, in the early modern period, it becomes very popular, such that we never really have direct access to the world. It's always mediated um, through, so, through experiences. And then you have a direct realism comes along and this is the disjunctivism, which says, no, no, in the right kind of conditions, your experiences, and we can skip the details here, but speaking loosely, in the right kind of conditions, your experiences take in the world, they're directly of the world. And in the bad conditions, they're not, they fall short of the world. So that's why it's disjunctive. There's like in the good case, you have experiences of one kind, which are world involving. And in the bad case, you have experiences of another kind, which aren't world involving. And, and that's what makes it a disjunction. What epistemological disjunctivism is a similar view, but it's at the level of, it's not at the metaphysical level, level of experiences, it's the level of reasons. Um, and, and so part of the innovation here is to keep the two things apart. I, in my own view, by the way, I'm also a metaphysical disjunctivist, but I'm trying to drag, drag the debate into the epistemological realm. And so get it, so uh, the, the question now is like in the perceptual case, for example, what are your perceptual reasons? Are there reasons which always fall short of the world? So reasons that you'd have which are indifferent as to whether in the good case or the bad case, or can your reasons be disjunctive? Can they be reasons of a particularly strong kind when you're in the good case and, and reasons of a, of a weak kind when you're in the bad case? even though the two cases are indistinguishable. And so, yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. Okay, perfect. I'm glad I'm tracking. All right, so then we can move on to, um, in the book, Epistemological Disjunctivism, you kind of highlight three prima facie problems for the disjunctivist view. So if you're okay, we can let's move on to those kind of problems, and then you can kind of demonstrate how they're not really problems for the position. Um, yeah and then we can move on from there. Yeah, good. So the, it, it might worth just briefly saying where the, the view comes from. So um, in, in McDowell's, where John McDowell has very influential work, which wasn't read by epistemologists at all, but he develops this position. Uh, it struck me that his view was just being equated with a metaphysical disjunctivism. And it seemed to me the point he was making really was specifically epistemic. And so that's why I wrote the book and why I, I coined this term epistemological disjunctivism to try and explained to epistemologists who weren't even considering really McDowell's view seriously what the view is and trying to present it in a sort of clear way which relates to epistemology and part of the challenge was because no one had really considered it is um, uh, it seemed like everybody agreed it was false but nobody had ever actually written down nobody could tell you why it was false it was just kind of like it's obviously false I mean that, that was kind of the reaction I got when I told people I was writing a book about this so like, why would you write a book about it a view that's obviously, it's funny now, it's only a few, like less than a decade ago. Now it's like a stand, it's like a common view of people talk about it. But back then it was regarded, well, it's obviously false, so why even talk about it? And of course, the problem with views which are regarded as obviously false is that there's no literature explaining why they're false because no one even bothers. So I had to come up with, try and formulate what, what might be the reasons they think it's false. So they're all kind of my own objections. Um, uh, and they kind of, uh, they're sort of, they sort of increase in force. So one reason um, is what's quite called the basing problem. Uh, you might think that it's false because um, uh, if there, if some people think that seeing that P is just a way of knowing that P, right? It's a fact of, re so knowing is also a fact of, of course, if you know that P then P. And some people think, well, seeing that P is just knowing in a particular way, right, through seeing. And then you might think, well, there's something puzzling about the idea that your knowledge that P, knowing that, let's say, there's a table here or whatever, you can be grounded in your seeing that P, if seeing that, seeing that there's a table there is itself knowing there's a table there. It looks kind of like it's just knowledge grounded in knowledge. Um, I, I actually don't think that's, I think knowledge can be grounded in knowledge. So I don't think it's actually 
a major problem. But, but I also argue that I don't think seeing that P is a kind of knowing anyway, for technical reasons, it falls short. Seeing that P, I think properly understood, is it puts us in a position to know. So that's a, it kind of guarantees we're in a good position to know, but it, it's consistent with that we might not be able to properly exploit that position. So I think it is, it is a different kind of state to knowing. And one thing I talk about in the book are the ways in which seeing that P and knowing that P can come apart. And if that's right, then anyone who is persuaded by the basis problem, I think, well, there's your answer, right? Seeing that P is distinct from knowing the P anyway. So there's nothing circumspect. It's not, no, it's not. If you think there's something, a problem about knowledge grounded in knowledge, well, then you're okay because seeing that P isn't necessarily knowledge. The next problem is, um, I call it the access problem. Um, it's kind of similar to a problem you get in um, uh, regarding content externalism. So some people think in the philosophy of mind and language, they think that the, the, the content of your thoughts is determined by the environment in part. So as it were, thoughts, the slogan is thoughts aren't, ain't, ain't just in the head. It's not just up to you what your thoughts mean. It's in part determined by factors such as your relationship to certain social structures, or it could be, in some cases, like with natural kind terms, it could be fa facts about the actual thing themselves, about the chemical composition of water or whatever could determine what thoughts you're thinking about. And then some people are puzzled, well, if, if that were true, and we have first person authority over our thoughts, i.e. we always know what we're thinking roughly, then it seems like, well, just by reflecting on our thoughts, we can come to know things about the world, because I can know, I can know that I'm thinking such and such thought, and then I can know because of content externalism that think, if I'm thinking that thought, then certain conditions in the world must hold. Therefore, I can know just by reflecting that these conditions in the world hold. Sometimes called the McKinsey problem. And someone might think, well, isn't something similar happening here with um, epistemological disjunctivism? I mean, I can reflect on my reasons and realize I've got factive reasons, and then factive reasons entail facts, right? So now, just by reflecting, surely I can come to know facts about the world. So, you know, I reflect on my reason, belief, and there's a table there. And I think, well, I can, see, I can see there's a table there. Well, seeing that P entails P, right? So now just by reflecting, I come to know there's a table there. And that looks puzzling. You, look, you, you, you shouldn't be able to know facts about the world just by, by introspection. Uh, I mean, you know facts about the world by investigating the world, right? But again, this is, I think, it's not a real problem. Um, so, what are you doing when you reflect on it? your reason? You're seeing that P is itself an empirical reason, which was gained by looking at, looking at the world. Right? So when you're reflecting on it, you're just drawing the consequences of that original empirical reason. You're not, as it were, finding a non-empirical route to the, to the world. You're just, as it were, extracting the consequences from your previous empirical engagement with the world. So I don't think it's any more puzzling than the fact that you might reflect. You know, I could reflect right now and think, well, I, here are some things I know about the world. Well, if I know them, they must be true, but I don't thereby come have a route to knowing that they're true, which is just reflective. I, it, all I'm doing is extracting my empirical knowledge of them, right, <laughs> reflectively. That's all I'm doing. So I know there's a puzzle there. But I think that this brings us to the third problem. And I think this really is the deep problem um, or, the, or why I think people are, are drawn to it. I call it the um, indistinguishability problem. So the thought is this, look, I can't tell the difference between, so the good case is where everything's going, everything's hunky-dory, you know, everything is just as I think it is and so on. And hopefully that's, the, that's what we're in, we're in the good case. And then the bad case is where we're radically deceived, nothing is as we think it is. And that, that's the that skeptical scenarios describe bad cases. And, this, and the epistemology Shantivist is saying that when you're in the good case, but not when you're in the bad case, only when you're in the good case, you can have these factive reasons and they genuinely are your reasons for believing. Um, well, reasons are accessible to you, right? You know what your reasons are. So I should be able now to infer something like this. Well, look, I know I've got factive reasons. Um, factive reasons, I'd only have factive reasons if I was in the good case. So I'm in the good case. And I'm, in particular, I'm in the good case and not the bad case. And the reason why that's puzzling is everyone agrees, including the disjunctivist, that we can't tell the difference between the good case and the bad case, right? I mean, they, they are indistinguishable by hypothesis. So if they're indistinguishable, how is it that I have a way of knowing that I'm in one case rather than the other? And, and I think that's the, the puzzle. I think people are thinking that somehow if, if, if this module's disjunctivism was, were true, then it would mean that you could, you could perform epistemic feats that are 
are impossible. Um, and I, and uh, so in the book, I try and explain um, how we can get around this. I mean, I, I think what's happened here is that is a failure to, to, to notice ways in which we can, but basically that there are ways of knowing the difference that aren't ways of telling the difference. So uh, take a familiar case or familiar to epistemologists anyway, it's a famous case by Fred Dretzky. You, you're at the zoo, you're looking at the zebras in a zebra enclosure. And you know it says clearly mark zebras, it's a good zoo and so on. Uh, they look like zebras, etc. Imagine now someone says to you, well, look, for all you know, surely they could be clever disguised mules, right? Uh, so this is our local area. Of it's not they're calling your beliefs in general in question, they're just calling your beliefs about this animal in, into question. Now, <clears throat> one way you could know that that's a zebra rather than a clever disguised mule is by having special discriminative powers. Um, you know, by being able to tell the difference, maybe you're a zoologist, or relatedly by making special checks, maybe getting up close or something like that, so that so that you can tell the difference. But I think often in cases like this, we can know the difference without, even though we can't tell the difference. I mean, in a normal run of events, I think we'd say we kind of reason like this: we'd think, well, look, I've got lots of background reasons for thinking that's a real zebra. You know, wh why would anyone go to the trouble of cleverly disguising a mule? Surely they'd get found out very easy. Surely there'd be penalties for this. This zoo is a really reputable zoo. Why would they do such a thing? How much effort would be involved in disguising a zebra as a clever disguised mule? What kind of psychological purpose would it serve to do it and so on? You know, it, the, the money involved, you know, it costs more to do that than just to have real zebras and so on. So there's all these kind of reasons that I can come up with. And they're all reasons which favor the hypothesis that's a zebra over a clever disguised mule. They're not, they're not reasons that enable me to distinguish between zebras and clever disguised mules, but they're reasons that favor one hypothesis over another. And I think often we can know the difference between two scenarios through favoring reasons. Um, so, and favoring reasons aren't the same as discriminating reasons, right? Now, if that's right, if you know the difference there, discriminating the difference, then I think we can apply that back to the good and the bad case. I mean, if you're a disjunctivist, what you're saying is that you've got favoring reasons. In fact, you've got favoring reasons of a particularly strong kind. Factive favoring, factive reasons are, are definitely favoring because they, they entail this one scenario over the other. And that's consistent with the fact you can't tell the difference. So, so your circumstance is something like this. Look, if you're in the bad case, you don't have the factive reasons. And of course, so there's nothing you can do with them. In the good case, in contrast, you do have the fact of reasons, and now it is legitimate for you to reason, well, you know, I, I have reasons now that favor this over that, and that's, that would be acceptable because it's, your reasoning is grounded in the factivity of these reasons. And that's consistent with the fact that you can't tell the difference. So, and I think that's what the junctivist should say. say, look, I, it's true. I can't tell the difference between, you know, the good case and the bad case, but yeah, it, it is legitimate for me to say that I know I'm in the good case and not the bad case. So that's kind of, that, that's, um, yeah, that's the way I respond to the distinguishability. And, and by the way, I should say that distinction between favoring and discriminating reasons, I'm arguing that that's just rooted in our ordinary ways of thinking. It's not, it's not something that's brought in just to defend disjunctivism. I claim everyone should endorse this, but it just so happens that with that distinction in play, disjunctivism looks a lot more plausible than it did the other two. Right, and that's something that you do kind of, one starts thinking about like there's a whole host of background information that one kind of draws from when they're making a conclusion about something that's like either seeing a zebra or a cleverly disguised mule. I do have a question though, and maybe this is, I don't know, it seems maybe it's a concern, I guess, of mine. I don't know. Um, but when I reflect on, or when I think about you laying about, so like the destructivist position of like the good cases and the bad cases. All right. So if we drop the bad cases for now, and we have good cases for um, some proposition or some some fact something out in the world does it entail some type of infallibility you know like if I'm seeing that this is there the case right and and I know it's the case I I don't know am, am I off is that off to or is that no but this is good because I think I think it's very natural to think that they think look if you've got fact I think it's very easy to confuse factivity with infallibility here's a way of seeing seeing why they that why they're different when you you can know things in a fallible way and when you know things knowledge is factive so i can have fallible knowledge that you know there's a table here forget about skepticism for a moment i can have ordinary fallible knowledge i've got a means because fallibility really is about it's a it's a 
Fallibility really is a claim about the way in which you came to have knowledge. It's about the process. So the process by which I come to know that there's a table here can be a fallible one. It could have led to error. In this case, it leads to, to truth. And so I have knowledge. But given that it is knowledge, of course, it's factive. So that means it must be true. And once you realize that knowledge is both factive and, and fallible, I mean, that's the, very rare that we have any, I'm not sure we do have any infallible knowledge, but certainly in the empirical case, we don't have any infallible knowledge. But we do have fact, but knowledge is always factive. And I think once you realize that, it becomes clear that whatever infallibility is, it's, it's a completely different thing to factivity. So the same with saying that P, I mean, the processes by which I come to form my beliefs in the good case, they're fallible because uh, even in the good case, I mean, I, I take it it'd be very difficult for them to result in error in the good case, but it's still possible. But certainly there are cases like the good case, but not quite as good where there'll be more error and so on. So that very same process, you know, will be in some conditions would lead to error as you move further away from the good case. So the process is fallible, but the idea is it, insofar as it's sufficiently, sufficiently good, sufficiently reliable, and it leads to success in the good case, then it gives you the fact of reason, just like with knowledge does. So yeah, these, these processes are fallible. There's no infallibility here. And related to this, you know, this point about how you can't tell the difference. You know, I think this is important to understanding that there's, it, this relates to sort of human fallibility. The skeptic, I think, kind of trades upon features of the human condition, which aren't really, they're not problematic, even if they might be concerning. I mean, here's one feature. We could be in the bad case, true. And if we are, we're doomed, that's true. That's not skepticism though, right? Because that's just a fact about our, 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 our predicament. Equally, it's also true, I can, we can't tell the difference between the good and the bad case. That's definitely true as well. So there's a kind of, there is a sort of fragility here, you know, it, whether or not we know things depends upon us being in the right kind of conditions and so on. But none of that in itself gets you skepticism. What gets you skepticism is some further claim about how even in the good case, your reasons can't support knowledge. And that's the thing, is that further claim. So it's important to get these other things that are there in the kind of in the background, which I think the skeptic is sort of subtly trading upon. Keep them apart, we should accept all that. Yeah, I could be wrong. If I am wrong, I'm doomed <laughs> uh, and I can't tell the difference. These are all trees are just facts about the human condition, right? We're not gods, we're human beings. Our access to the world, there are certain inherent limitations to it, but none of that entails that in the good case, we don't know things, which is what the skeptic needs to claim. I, I think another, and I guess another question I have is, um, I don't know if this is too strong, I guess, to re like require of the disjunctivist position, but how many ca good cases would we, would we are we actually in i guess if that makes sense um you know i don't know if i i don't know if that's the right question to ask it just seems that you know like i like offhandedly i can think of like a bad situation where the fact of reasons aren't there like you know like if someone were to take some type of hallucinatory drug right like they're on a, they're having a hallucination that seems discriminating and like favoring why that's their what they're seeing yeah. is not there but on the counter side yeah how how would we find ourselves really in the good position or in the good, you know? Yeah, so the, the, the good, I, I think the good condition is, they're paradigmatic conditions. And as I say, that they're, they're both subjectively and objectively. So that it has to be both, a, it, it feels to you like everything's going fine and everything is in fact going fine. So, you know, obviously hallucinations, that would, that would suffice to put you in the bad case. Um, any, any kind of fiddling about with the environment or something like that, you know. Uh, and and it, actually, if you become convinced, even if you're not in, even if things are actually objectively are fine, but you're convinced they're not, that's enough to put you in the back case as well. So I think there are, there are it is quite strict. Um, but the good cases, I think, are fairly broad. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that our, our grasp of epistemic concepts is primarily understood relative to the good case. That is, I mean, think about how we train people up. Uh, Wittgenstein talks about this, actually. It's, we, don't, we don't teach people what good cases are. We don't, in fact, related to this, we don't teach people what the normal case is. We teach them what the abnormal case is. And this is kind of what we do with the epistemic concepts as well. You know, you, you learn about what knowledge is by knowing when it goes wrong. You learn about what good conditions are by learning by when they're bad. And I think what we've got there, we have ways of picking out the negative which presuppose this prior, the, this, well, the default is this prior conception of, of the good case. 
So I think the good case, you know, our, our grasp of and our learning of epistemic concepts is always relative to uh, p- being able to pick out exceptions to the good case. So it's kind of like our, our, our own epistemic concepts are kind of already indexed to that good case where things, nothing is going wrong subjectively or objectively. And those are the conditions under which uh, we have the fact of reasons. And, th- and this is reflective in our, in our practices, you know, uh, Obviously, you can you can subject if you can subjectively think nothing's awry, and objectively there is, and then in that case you'd have to correct yourself when you, it becomes apparent to you. But if if nothing does correct, then you know if it looks like it is and it is, then we we give factive reasons. So we kind of we default to the factive reason, but we need we need as it were a good reason to to hold to pull back from the factive reason and go for a non-factive reason. So it's like that the default is the factive reason. But if there's any indication that there's things aren't aren't good, then we then then we we pull back from that. You know, like the person on the phone call, you know, maybe they can't see them clearly or something, or they start to doubt to themselves, and then they say, "Well, it looks to me like they're here or whatever." Well, now that's that's because they think they're not in the good case anymore. Interesting. That's where I, I was going to ask that. I was going to ask a question like that, to where, you know, someone who has a fact of reason, but then starts doubting themselves. Um, either through memory for whatever reason they're just someone's questioning them and they're like well maybe did I really see them uh in that case then their fact of reasons you're saying would go start shifting to kind of the bad case I guess or into those yeah I mean I think you know you can there's a I think there's a certain pathology that can you can guess where infect yourself with doubts and and once you do then that that can undermine the epistemic standing of your beliefs and I think that's actually a familiar thought. I mean, in some respects, it's not even that bad. And sometimes it's it's invidious, but sometimes it's not. So, um, you know, there's um, Kate Elgin, the epistemologist, remarked one time, it's a nice little thought. She says that sometimes there's an epistemic efficacy in stupidity. And what she meant by that is, like, sometimes not agonizing about doubts and so on means that, you know, when when things are actually okay, not agonizing about doubts is like a good way of just keeping your knowledge. Because when you start to doubt and start to agonize about things and start to think about things, it can undermine your conviction. And, it, and I, on, on my view, and I think this is the right view, once you're subjectively in the bad case, you're in the bad case. It doesn't matter that you're objectively in the good case because it's got to be both objectively and subjectively good. So it's got to not only be a good case, but you've got to actually think you're in the good case too. So, so doubt, doubt can undermine epistemic standing. But I think that's kind of, it does, right? It does. So something that, that you wrote in um, your introductory to skepticism book, you um, I think it was like the last chapters, you had um, a, a, um, a paragraph, maybe not a paragraph, but just the last subsections were intellectual virtues. So it's not like you're saying like, and I guess in a pathological sense, like having these doubts um, or maybe even anxieties, but um, there's a healthy amount of doubt so how does that, how would that factor in? So like, you know, like local doubt, I think that's kind of how you um, described it. So it's like, you know, there's a healthy amount of, lo- uh, of doubt that one or skepticism one should, one might be able to have in the, in the, in the sense of between like, you have gullibility on one side, and then you have uh, closed mindedness, closed yeah, mindedness yeah. on the other side, and then you have kind of like the middle, the intellectual or the humility. So how does that, how would that factor into kind of the destructivist position? Uh, if one is to remain to have, so I get, okay, here's my question. If one is supposed to have the humility, how does that affect the fact of reasons for good cases um, as it relates to kind of the destructivist position? Yeah, good. So I have this, so I, I, I'm a big fan of the intellectual virtues. It's sort of Aristotelian view about, um, so the, the, the Aristotelians think, Aristotle thought that the, the good life was the virtuous life, the, a certain kind of admirable character traits that we can have, which help us to flourish. One aspect of this is intellectual, some of it's moral, some of it's practical, but one aspect's intellectual. It could be guided by a, a desire for the truth, a desire for accuracy, and the kind of traits that go with that curiosity, intellectual humility, intellectual tenacity, and so on. And I think a, a lot of people are down on this view, um, and in particular down on intellectual humility, because I think they misunderstand what it is. So they think that intellectual humility is like having a kind of downgraded. It's like not. So if you've got intellectual humility, you can't have conviction in anything. And I think that's a, that's actually not just wrong, but I think it's dangerous. Um, having intellectual humility, I think, properly understood, is entirely compatible with having conviction. And often, I think it's quite right for us to have conviction. 
we show our intellectual humility, I think, by a willingness to listen to others. It's kind of, it's, it's not about us, as it were, it's about listening, it's outward, outward directing. We show how we're intellectually humble by the fact that we're willing to take seriously other people's opinions, we listen to them carefully. We're in the process, we'll, we'll return to our own opinions and reflect on them and so on. Um, but reflecting on your opinions and being willing to consider opposing opinions or whatever is entirely compatible with having conviction in your own opinions. And I, this is one thing I do. I mean, I, I run a sort of curriculum project on this, trying to bring the virtues into the curriculum. One of the things I'm trying to emphasize is that, you know, having conviction doesn't mean shouting down the opposition, right? And it, you know, it being intellectually tenacious, which I think is a virtue, is not about not listening to people you disagree with. I think some people think it is like that. You know, they think that somehow that they, you, you reveal a lack of conviction if you listen to others, right? You know, that there's kind of, you find there's these debates on social media kind of like, sort of an intellectual purity or moral purity, they kind of go hand in hand. Don't listen to people who disagree with you because that's kind of showing that you don't really, you're not really committed to it. I think that's completely wrong. Um, you should listen to others and perfect them. And that's entirely compatible with having conviction in your opinions. So what I'm trying to get across to students is how being intellectually humble and being intellectually tenacious, having conviction, properly understood they're, they're entirely compatible. Now it's difficult. And this is the, the famous, problem of the golden mean, right? We have to, if you're an Aristotelian, you have, you're always trying to navigate between two vices. So every virtue lies between two vices, a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. So, you know, within intellectual humility, the vice of excess is kind of not believing anything and just being so humble that you just, you know, they, they all joke that if your mind's too open, your, your brains fall out, that kind of thing. And then of course the other, the other, there's the excess of deficiency, which is just being dogmatic and not listening to others and so on. And, and so what you have, what the virtuous person has is the good judgment um, to, to navigate between, uh, between those two extremes. And that's true of all the virtues. Uh, you have to, it requires good judgment. And I don't think, uh, as Aristotle said, there's no, there's no rule book, right? You, you learn this through, um, ideally by getting to know people who already have that judgment and, uh, and emulating them. And I think that's, if you think about our own lives, this is, this is exactly what you do. You know, we want to hang around with the right kind of people, um, particularly people who uh, have more experience and so forth, and see how they behave and see their wisdom in action. It helps you to see how you need to behave and how you need to make your judgments. Yeah, so this is all about going back to your quick, it's all about finding a way to having a live skepticism. You want to be skeptical enough that you're not gullible, you know, just accepting things, but understanding how that can be compatible with having conviction, you know, having com commitments and following through on your commitments, you know, and, and so on. Because these are also important things to a good life. Um, uh, complete and utter doubt is kind of become self-destructive. One question I have kind of, um, as you kind of laid out your whole position, what would it take Maybe that's not the right word, right wording, but um, to kind of demonstrate why maybe the disjunctivist position isn't an accurate reflection of our experience. So, what it would like, for example, like would a theory of mind that kind of takes a more, like for example, it seems pretty popular, like a computational theory of mind, kind of like like the way, um, yeah, I, how do I word this? So, would a theory of mind undermine a disjunctivist position? Uh, that's not compatible, that wouldn't be compatible with it. I don't know if that's the right wording or the right kind of question. Uh, the people, there, there is a literature about this. I mean, this is really primarily about metaphysical disjunctivism though. So metaphysical disjunctivism is committed to certain claims about the nature of perceptual experience. And some people have argued that those claims are compatible with certain empirical views about the nature of perceptual experience. So there is this big debate about this. Um, and, and so that's a possibility. It could be that metaphysical disjunctivism isn't consistent. I mean, I, I'm not probably the best place to, to, to judge, but, but people who are well placed to judge tell me that the issue is moot. So I, I sort of trust them on this. Uh, but, but it's always possible when you're a philosopher and you engage in claims like that, that you, you're kind of hostage to fortune. There could be something that comes along. Uh, I mean, look at what happened with Chomsky and linguistics. It challenged lots of philosophical presuppositions about uh, language acquisition and so on. Um, so yeah, that's a problem. But the interesting question is the extent to which epistemological disjunctivism is wedded to metaphysical disjunctivism. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I say, I, I endorse both. Mm -hmm. uh, I think McDowell endorses both, or I don't know, some people disagree about that. Uh, 
uh, and it's certainly their natural bedfellows, right? They they seem naturally to go together. But I have argued that, like from a logical point of view, you could have one without the other. Uh, there's not there's no straight entailment there, right? There's a, you could be an epistemological disjunctivist and not a metaphysical disjunctivism, disjunctivist. So, so one option here, if 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 the sort of um, the cognitive science goes in a different direction, is you could have the epistemological disjunctivism, but not the metaphysical one. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you would lose some motivation, right? Because if some the people who are metaphysical disjunctivists now they you, you you lose that motivation because you can't tie yourself to that view. But then maybe you'll get other other advantages. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to see your thoughts on that. All right. So kind of moving a little forward. So I in our previous conversation and or and through email, you had mentioned that uh, epistemological disjunctivism is only like part of your uh, view. And you kind of bring in Wittgenstein's uh, hinge commitment uh, into the into play. So if you wouldn't mind kind of going over a little bit of that uh, and how it kind of relates holistically to your view. So that puzzle I began with, if you remember, I said that really I thought it was two puzzles in disguise. And I think this is why we've struggled so much with it. Um, so in my, I have a book from a few years ago called Epistemic Angst, and I, I talk about this in some detail about how logically, you, there are two ways of formulating that. And most people think that they're just kind of equivalent formulations. But I argue, in fact, that actually they're logically different. And logically different in a way that is revealing, because I think um, sometimes logical differences don't really matter, dialectically speaking. But here I think they do, because the, the different formulations, I think, trade upon different, you know, when I said the skeptic must smuggles in these philosophical claims disguised as common sense, I think actually each formulation is smuggling in a slightly different claim. So one formulation I think is, is smuggling in this anti-disjunctivist claim, this claim about the insularity of reasons. And I think disjunctivism, epistemological disjunctivism is the antidote to that formulation. But there's a slightly different formulation. And what it's smuggling in is a slightly different idea. And I call it the universality of rational evaluation. And what I mean by that is this thought that we can rationally evaluate all our beliefs all at once. Now that sounds like a harmless idea. It's actually a um, nice manifestation of this is in Descartes and his meditations. So Descartes talks about how it be, it like beliefs as being apples in a barrel. And he says, well, one, one thing you can do is you can inspect each apple one by one. He says, but no, he has a more radical approach. He's going to tip all the apples out and only let them back in the barrel once he's satisfied that they're, they're in good order. So the idea is, you know, we can, we can just evaluate all our beliefs all at once. And that looks fine. Like, I mean, we can, the thought is we can just extend the scope of rational evaluation as much as we want and it will. And I think that one of the big ideas that Wittgenstein had in his final notebooks, which were published as Uncertainty, take the notebooks take us right up to before he died, just a few days before he died, uh, is this thought that there's actually something deeply incoherent about that picture of rational evaluation. And I think he was right about this. Um, Wittgenstein argues, and I, I think persuasively, that it's part of the very structure of rational evaluation in order to rationally evaluate, do any ra rational value, whether positive or negative, whether skeptical or you know, diff, you know, positive, giving reasons positive kind or doubting reasons of negative kind, there's always has to be this these, this backdrop of certainty in place, which enables the rational evaluation to occur. He calls them hinge, he calls them hinge propositions. I call them hinge commitments. They're the they're the hinges relative to which rational evaluations occur. They have to hold fast. And for that reason, they cannot be themselves rationally evaluated. And so Wittgenstein in these final notebooks, I think he goes through, it's not so much an argument as case by case. He gives lots of cases and he, he drills down on them to show the oddity of thinking about our everyday certainties as being grounded at all. I mean, so we've been talking today about hands. It's very natural in the context of skepticism. You know, I've got two hands. G. Moore said, Famously said he had two hands. That's why he thought he knew there was an external world because he knew he had two hands. Wittgenstein, though, makes an interesting move. Wittgenstein basically says, you don't know you've got two hands. Uh, you're certain of it, that's true. Uh, it doesn't function like a normal empirical claim. It looks like it does, right? It looks like it's just a normal claim. Um, like it looks like it's similar to a claim like whether, whether I've got two hands, looks like it's functioning like whether or not I've got um, a dollar in my pocket. You know, just an ordinary empirical claim. Wittgenstein says, no, look closely at how it functions. 
I mean, for example, suppose you said to me, um, I mean, let's take the keys in my pocket. You say, Duncan, have you got your keys in your pocket? It makes perfect sense for me to sort of slap my thigh as it was. Oh yeah, there they are. Yeah, there they are. Duncan, have you got two hands? Imagine now I go, hang on a minute, let's have a look. Oh, there they are. <laughs> makes no sense at all. You know, I mean, let's suppose just like in some strange scenario, I look for my hands and there's nothing there. What do I do now? Do I just say, oh yeah, no, I haven't got hands. No, no, I don't. I might probably the first thing I do is my eyes. What's wrong with my eyes? Right. The biggest thing I says, what gets tested by what? What the point he's making is that there are certain things, and they are the things relative to which everything else is tested, as it were. They're the fixed points. And everything else is kind of moving relative to them. And the, the game of reasons is all about having or having the certainties in play, which enables these localized rational evaluations to occur. He's not saying you can't doubt the hinges. He's saying rather that. At any one time, whatever whatever circumstance you're in, there's always something functioning as a hinge. There's always some backdrop of certainty which is enabling rational evaluations to occur. So um, if that's right, then the very idea of universal rational evaluations, you know, whether the ones a skeptic makes or even the ones the, anti, the traditional anti-skeptic makes, right? Because the, the anti traditional anti-skeptic wants to rationally evaluate all our beliefs at once and find them in good order. Both projects are simply incoherent. And moreover, it's, it's not that this is like a cognitive limitation on our part, right? As if, if only we were cleverer or something like that, or you have, we, if only we had developed a different system of rational evaluation. Wittgenstein keeps coming back to this thought. He says, no, it's, it's a matter of logic. This is what it is. This is what rational evaluations are like. There, can, there cannot be such a thing as, as a universal rational evaluation. So to aspire to them, is like aspiring for a, you know, to draw a circle square. It's kind of, it's, it's an absurd aspiration. And I, so I think, again, this is a, a thought that gets smuggled into the skeptical puzzle, right? It may say, it feels harmless. It feels like, well, you know, we, why can't we just rationally evaluate all our beliefs at once? Because I'm saying this is a, this is a, this is a theoretical claim. And it's, it's actually, when you think about it, completely implausible. And, and it's important because um, what the skeptic is trying to get us to do is to get us to see that we, through skeptical scenarios, trying to get us to rationally evaluate our beliefs at once. And then when we realize we can't do it, to try and infer skeptical consequences from this. But rather what we need to do instead is to understand what, what would it, if we take seriously, there can't be universal rational evaluations that they can only ever be localized. You know, what, what does that mean for our, we have a completely different epistemology now. And so that's one thing I've been trying to develop. So there's these two sides. Uh, I mean, in a sense, one's positive and one's kind of more negative, I suppose. I don't know. I don't, I don't think of it this way, but I can see from an external point of view, you can see it that way. You know, I'm saying rational evaluations are never universal. So in that sense, all of our rational support is always local. I mean, I'm arguing that that's like Wittgenstein, that's fine. That's just what rational support is. It's not a, it's not a failing in our rational support. It, it, it couldn't be otherwise. But our, our localized rational support can also be factored in the right kind of conditions. So as it were, in one sense, the rational support we have is different. It's, it's not as universal as we thought it was. Uh, but that's not meant to be a drawback. But insofar as it is there, it's localized, it can be much stronger than we thought it was. So that, that's how the two things fit together. And, and I think this is how we resolve the problem. We have to, this basically, I, I call it a bioscopic response, because what I'm saying is that what looked like a single problem was really two problems. And then what we need to do is have a, a unified solution. So ways of fitting together this, each of the solution to each. And I think this is a reason why each of the, each of the solutions by themselves, the Wittgensteinian and the epistemological disjunctivism, they can feel kind of odd. Disjunctivism seems to say we can rationally evaluate our beliefs all at once via these factive reasons. I don't think that's what they should say once they combine it with the Wittgensteinian view. And the Wittgensteinian view seems to say, well, reasons just kind of end, don't they? They kind of, they end quite quickly. As Wittgenstein says, the, 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 the spade turns rather quickly. Uh, you know, you reach solid ground quicker than you thought. Well, that's true. But it, that doesn't mean there's any, we have shaky foundations. After all, we can have the fact of reasons as the disjunctivist tells us. So I think it's a case of understanding how there's these two theoretical claims of skeptics smuggling in. They're both dubious. They're not rooted in common sense at all. They both should be rejected. And once you reject them, you ended up with this way of thinking about epistemology radically different to what we thought, but which is in fact rooted in our ordinary practices. I mean, we, 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 we we misdescribed our ordinary practices. That's why we didn't see this. And that's why we were led into the skeptical puzzle. Interesting. Okay. 
It makes a lot more sense now. Uh, definitely hearing it from you explain it uh, in more detail. Because like, you know, I mean, definitely through my reading and stuff, I'm like, okay, it makes sense, but I need more or uh, more explanation, I suppose. So in hind so what you're saying kind of overall is that the two claims or one was about like kind of the fear, I guess I'll just use like something that's easier for me, but like to understand like a theory of perception that once you kind of undermine that, that's no longer, that's, that's one part solved and destructivism yeah. solves that problem. The other problem is that skepticism or the radical skeptical position is trying to undermine all rational evaluation. And once we understand it in a way that we were saying like from a kind of a big, big uh point of view that you can't rationally evaluate everything in that way, like all your beliefs in that way, it only could be localized. So then that part too is no longer a problem here uh, yeah. because it can't, it's, it's not, Either I guess it just can't be done or it's just not something that, yeah, I guess it just can't be done according to like the Wittgensteinian view. Um, yeah, I mean, Wittgenstein's saying it's a, it's a matter of logic. So he says that it's you know, whoever you are, yeah. you know, even if, even if aliens have a system of rational evaluation, right, it would be the same. They'd have the same structure to it. That, that's just what rational evaluation is. It has to have this certainty in the backdrop. And then, so then you're saying it can, I guess, Maybe the paradox doesn't come to play, but the but to have what can be rationally evaluated is localized beliefs. Um, so it's beliefs that are. Is it so? Is it kind of one of the things where it's like if you look at it from like a I guess an order, right? So you have like your hinge commitments, and then you have other beliefs that are inside, kind of, the hinge commitment. Uh, those can be rationally evaluated, but the hinge commitment itself cannot be rationally evaluated. Yeah. So the, the hinge commitments, they're, they're, they're the, the hinges on which rational evaluation occurs. So they can't themselves be rationally evaluated, but they, they make it possible for these other beliefs to be rationally evaluated. The hinges can change, you know, I mean, in different conditions, what was a hinge before could be a normal belief, whereas a normal belief could become a hinge. Uh, Wittgenstein has this nice metaphor of the, the riverbed. Um, you know, there's the, the what, what is it, one point part of the river? Could be another point part of the riverbed and vice versa and notice they have a kind of an interrelationship the river partly dictates the nature of the riverbed and the riverbed partly direct dictates the, the course of the river um and that, that's kind of how he sees i think our ordinary beliefs ordinary commitments how they relate to our hinge commitments okay i guess one final one question then is what makes one what makes what makes a hinge commitment is it just uh something that's like its final resting place. It kind of reminds me of like a foundationalist kind of point, but. It's an inversion of foundation. So traditional foundationalism is the thought that we find, we find these foundations and what makes them foundations is that they have a special epistemic status. You know, they're infallible, incorrigible, indubitable or whatever. Wittgenstein's saying, no, no, the, 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 these certainties which play this foundational role have no epistemic status at all. <laughs> that's the inversion of it so in a sense they're not foundations they're kind of like enablers or something uh it's not like they have a, sp a special epistemic status um we, they were optimally certain of them though. i mean this is what uh, i think I, I talk about this in terms of uh, epistemic vertigo we get a kind of vertigo when we become aware of our interests we're not normally even aware of them i mean this is one of the real insights i think of wittgenstein when he discusses this that the thing about our hinge commitments like i have two hands we never know, nobody teaches you you've got two hands, right? People teach you to do things with your hands. And, and, and this is true of hinges in general. They're kind of in the background. As Wittgenstein says, you swallow them down with everything that you're taught. There's a certain kind of world picture, a certain kind of certainty. And what it is to learn at all is to swallow down that certainty and there's certain elements of it. And then, then you become a person that can engage other people and learn other things. But you have to have the certainty in place before anything can happen. And that certainty involves kind of swallowing down this picture. Um, so that means that when you do become aware of them and become aware of the role they play, they, they feel uncanny. So Stanley Cavell talks about this. Um, so the, if, uncanny in the Freudian sense, you know, that they, they feel kind of strange, a little bit horrific. You know, the everyday, that which is most everyday, that which is most mundane, is normally never even observed. It's kind of hidden in plain view right in front of us. And then when we do see it and see it for its everydayness, it doesn't feel everyday anymore. It feels uncanny. And I think that's kind of like an, an uneasiness in our epistemic position when we realize that these, these claims, they're right in front of us all along, but they're playing this special role. And we have no rational basis for them at all, properly understood in the Wittgensteinian view. 
And I think that gives us a kind of vertigo. And I, I, what I mean by that is it's like a kind of phobic reaction. You know, imagine you're high up, you're not in any danger, you know, you're safe and secure and everything, but you're high up and you feel, it's like being safe and secure doesn't give you any comfort, right? You still, it's kind of like a, an instinctive reaction. And I think that's what we have. It's like, we think, oh gosh, that's, that's odd. You know, these everyday claims, they're certainties. That of which we're most, most certain of, we have no rational basis for. It feels kind of unsettling. But the, the, the key thing is, is to recognize that how it all fits together. You know, in ordinary life, where we're not aware of these things, our ordinary practices are absolutely fine as they are in this school. Uh, you don't need to be aware of them. It, it doesn't matter. They're, they're just part of the backdrop against which the things that do matter get evaluated. So uh, maybe that maybe I'm I don't know if this is confusion on my part. Probably it, it may it probably is. But are they are the hinge commitments itself? So they're not they're non rational, all right. So uh, like for example, like I um, kind of like what you said, like uh, they were our hinge commitments are these certainties. Like no one taught you teaches you that you have to like uh, that you have hands. It kind of reminds me of like you know like children like they just and I think a lot of people they just you know obviously the external world exists and you know without even question. Um, but those, are those themselves like those certainties? If they're non-rational, maybe, maybe I'm just having a hard time with this. Is it, are they believe? so what are, they're not beliefs or would they be beliefs, I guess? Is that, you know, like, um, if that makes sense. So if they are beliefs, I'm, I, oh, here's an example. Oh, this like, is good. Yeah, you, 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 you're asking exactly the right question from my perspective. So, so one thing I say about hinges is precisely that. Don't think of them as beliefs. Okay. So th this have to be confused because in, in ordinary life that we use the word belief in a really broad way. In, in, I mean, not outside philosophy, just in general. You know, any any kind of endorsement of a proposition is a belief, right? Um, but yeah. philosophers tend to use belief in a more narrow sense. It's like believing it to be true, like it's like a commitment to its truth or something like that. Um, and it's kind of a commitment to its truth that's kind of reasons responsive or something in some broad sense. I mean, here's a test, I think, for belief in the epistemological sense. You can't believe that P whilst recognizing you've got no reason for thinking P is true. So if you are committed to P, but you've got, you recognize you've got no reason for thinking P is true, then whatever that is, it's not a believing in that sense. It's like a, a, a wishing that or a hoping that. Or so. It could be lots of different things, but it's not a believing that. I think in the folk sense, it would be a belief, but not in the philosophy sense. And, um, and I think hinges don't pass that test. You know, you can become aware and in fact, this is what I think this is our predicament when we do philosophy, right? We become aware that our most basic certainties aren't rationally grounded. And, uh, but we, we don't lose them. Uh, we, we, know, we might say we doubt them, but that's just a fiction. As Wittgenstein says, our commitment to them is manifest in our actions. And then this, this is, <laughs> seems to be entirely true. I mean, you, can, you can say, I doubt it or, or whatever. You can use mouth the words, but then watch people go out and live their lives. They don't doubt it. The certainty is grounded in their actions. And I think this is why it's different to a belief. You know, beliefs are the kinds of things you obviously can be irrational, but in a general sense, the reasons change, your beliefs change with them. That's because what it is to be a believer. Hinge commitments are a different kind of propositional attitude. It's it's kind of as Wittgenstein says, they're they're animal, they're visceral, um, they're brute. They're not. Um, they're a different kind of uh, mental state to a believing. So that's why I want to keep them apart because I I think once you start thinking about them as beliefs, then so some people think of Wittgenstein's commitments as being like assumptions or hypotheses or something like that. Wittgenstein, I think, is very clear. They're nothing like that. I mean, an assumption is the kind of thing that you can be agnostic about. You know? mm. uh, and a hypothesis is something which you don't really think is true. That's not what it is with, I mean, the hinge commitments, it's a, it's a visceral certainty. Manifests, manifests entirely in your actions. Um, you know, Fikensai says in the beginning was the deed. Look at look at action, look at how people behave, and you can see the certainty is invested in the action. And the certainty manifests itself as regards to these these everyday commitments. I've got hands and so on. Okay. I think I understand now. So it's kind of like um kind of going back to an analogy that you had that you had brought up earlier. So it's like me studying, like doing philosophy here at a desk and having doubts and taking radical skepticism seriously and doubting that the external world exists. And, but then as soon as I put the paper down, close the laptop and I go walk outside my door, I'm interacting with people, I'm going, I'm doing something. So yeah, that's, the, cert like, that's the certainty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even at the moment when you say 
So saying that you doubt isn't itself doubting. Doubting is always more than just saying that you doubt. You know, that, or, or put it this way, a, 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 a real doubt as opposed to merely a verbal or thought doubt is, is like a doubt that's manifested in your behavior. But, mm. but you can never doubt your hinge commitments in that sense. I mean, you can say you do, right? But you don't. Uh, you know, it's just clear, you know, you, you know, it's not like you're really thinking the world is just, you know, you, when you sit down, why do you think the chair is going to be there when you, you know, when your bottom hits the seat, right? And so on. Everything about your actions reveals your certainty that, you, that there is no real doubt here. Interesting. Okay. It kind of reminds me, I guess, like, a, like with free will, right? Where you can have, you know, like a hard yeah. determinist saying that we don't have free will, but then, you know, uh, they go out and live their lives and talk meaningfully about choices and uh, people's actions and changing things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Notice though, there's there's one big difference. So, uh, so in the free will debate, it's true you can't you can't believe you've not got free will, right? Even if it, whether or not it's true, whether or not you have got free will is one thing. Whether or not you can believe you've got free will is another thing. Yeah. So I think most people accept you you can't consistently believe you've not got free will, but of course that doesn't tell you anything about whether or not you have it. Mm -hmm. So same here, but the, the thing is, it's not just, the claim isn't just that you, you can't doubt these things. The claim isn't that because you can't doubt these things, therefore they have a special status. Uh, it's rather, it's true you can't doubt them, but but it, there's also there's this further claim about why they have this, this hinge epistemology claim. That, as it were, that's what's doing the work, not the not the sort of the fact you can't doubt them. I, this is important because there's, there's some people like Strawson, they say, oh, well, Wittgenstein's point is just, well, look, you can't doubt them. Therefore, it's good that you're good to believe them, right? Because you can't doubt them. But that's not what he's saying. He's trying to say, realizing you can't doubt them is part of like one of the steps in the journey of realizing the special role they play and this and recognizing this broader point about the locality of, of rational evaluation. So what you need is a diagnostic story. It's a diagnostic story about why universal rational evaluations are impossible. That's what's doing the anti-skeptical work. That's what's explaining the... That's what's explaining the error. You know, like, as I said, the Wittgensteinian thing is all about, you've got to, when you've presented with a philosophical puzzle, you've got to step back and retrace your steps and find it. Well, at what point did the, the skeptical claim get Im imported here under the guise of common sense? You know, there's, you know, don't think that only ways of thinking have any, anything problematic about them. They're fine. Something's gone wrong from, from ordinary practices to our description of them from a philosophical point of view. And the challenge is to untease it back and find that, that that key moment where it went to Ryan, diagnose it and then remove it. And then, as he would say, the fly then finds its way out of the fly bottle. Okay, awesome. Um, I have one last thing I wanted to ask you about skepticism sure. before we kind of close. Um, one pushback, at least when I think about skepticism um, and someone maybe offering a paradox of what, we, what you described earlier, I guess one comment, maybe not a common response, but one response seems to be that it's just not relevant, you know, um, in our lives, right? So I kind of think about it in this way, where say that I am in uh, brain in a vat, does that change a lot of things to where, you know, I'm still gonna have it, I still have an experience of like a subjective experience, but I still have a family, like even if it is still an illusion, like nothing is meaningfully changing in my life. So it's not really relevant uh, in the discussion about, um, I'm in a I'm in a brain in a vat or something like that. Um, yeah. No. What do you What do you kind of yeah. think about that? Or is that just Would you say that's just too? Uh, that doesn't really answer the the paradox. It's just kind of a. Uh, well, some people have tried. So just David Chalmers has a go at this of trying to say, well, in a sense, you know, as where your thoughts now in the in the vat are going to pick out. So you don't have any real parents. You have kind of fat parents or something like that. You don't have real friends. You got vat friends and so on. So what does it really matter? It seems to me, it seems to me it matters everything in the world. I mean, think about it. So forget about skepticism for a minute, but just think about the um, Nozick and his experience machine, right? So Nozick has this, this scenario, you know, do you want a life in the experience machine where you can pick, pick the life you have in terms of your experiences? You know, maybe it's just hedonism and so forth. But of course, everything's fake, right? But, but yeah, but it'll be fun. Or do you want the real life with all the challenges and so on? And I, of course, some people will say, yeah, I'll, I'll go for the hedonistic one. But um, 
but I think that's, that that judgment, as it were, isn't kind of as it were stable under reflection. And what I mean by that is, you know, well, think maybe you don't care, but maybe it was your kids. Do you want your kids to have the real life, or do you want to have the life with that? Do you want your friends to have the real life? And then when you start to think through, what what does it really mean, right? So, in the in the experience machine, you've got all of that. Let's suppose you're working hard for something. I mean, there's no achievements in that, right? I mean, there's no there are no successes. You know, everything is just fake. Your, your relationships, they're, they're not real relationships. They're just, they're fake too. Your parents aren't your parents. And your friends aren't your friends. I mean, it's really, it's actually when you start to think it through, I think, that's why I say it's not stable under reflection. It's actually pretty horrific. I think this even about the, um, the Truman Show, remember that film a few years ago about the guy, he lives on a, on a TV set. I, I thought that film, I thought they made it, they missed a trick there because that film could have been a, a lot more horrific than it. I mean, when you really think through how horrific it is, I mean, like, for example, his wife, what is his wife? I mean, what his wife's an actress, right? I mean, think about what that is, right? They have, they have kids and stuff, you know? I mean, it's, it's pretty, and his best friend and everything. It's really, it, I think it's, 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 it's deeply disturbing when you think that it's all fake. Um, basically, I think a good life has got to be the real thing. And, um, and it, it's interesting, actually, why it has to be the real thing, but it, but it does. So, so I think it does matter. Um, the other reason why it does so sometimes people say, well, maybe like so one version of that is the version the it doesn't matter, but worry. One version is one you just had where you just say, well, look, even if I was a brain of that, who cares? And then another version is, well, look, I can't know the difference, so so who cares? Which is slightly different. It's not like if I am, it doesn't matter. It's like even if I'm not, it doesn't matter because I can't tell the difference. But I think it, it it matters even then to take the, the problem seriously because um I think a lot of um uh, a lot of our problems we face as a society, they subtly trade on sort of skeptical themes uh, in illicit ways. I mean, I think, you know, some of these drives towards sort of fake news, sort of rel relativistic ideas and in, 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 in modern, uh, you know, uh, politics as it, as it manifests itself in the social media age, I think often they're trading on these, they're subtly trading on these skeptical ideas and they're doing it for political purposes. They don't want you to believe things. They don't want you to be committed to things. They don't want you to think there's an objective truth and so on. And I think it's serving a, a you know, it's serving a political point. So I think that's another reason to try, you know, be able to think clearly about skepticism and to understand where these problems go awry, because it gives you some armory to resist some of these, uh, these sort of moves. I mean, remember here, what's interesting is the people who are pitching these ideas, they're not skeptics, right? They believe things. <laughs> they believe there's objective truth. You know, they, they don't believe in post facts or anything, they, but they, they'll, they'll, they'll use that because they want to get you to believe that because it's, it's convenient to them to have you believe these things. And they'll trade on subtly on skeptical things to, in order to do that. You know, we see it with some of this anti vaxxing stuff that's going on. I mean, we, it doesn't even, I don't want to tie it particularly to that because for any phenomenon, there's always a version of this that manifests itself. All right. Well, you've been more than generous with your time. Uh, is there a place where people can find you or, um, yeah, um, website, blog? Yeah, I mean, I, I, pretty much everything I write, I put on my, um, on my uh, you know, copyright be damned. I put it on my, <laughs> my webpage, which is, uh, um, I've forgotten the address, but it, I think it's just duncanpritchard.org. I should know it, but it's, uh, it's a pretty, um, uh, yeah, duncanpritchard.org. So there you go. So that's um, everything's on there. And of course, yeah, and I, you know, I like things like this, um, I should be more diligent about putting on, but they usually things these days, one of the advantages of the information age is that uh, most things are easy to find, right? So yeah. <laughs> my email address is on there as well. So you can always email me and I can send you stuff. Cool. And I'll leave that all in the description below for our listeners to uh, check out. Uh, but thanks again uh, for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks, Jacob. That was really good fun. Thank you. And that concludes another episode. See you next time. Oh,